Hello, it's Eric Strong from Strong Medicine, and today I'm discussing the median arcuate ligament syndrome, abbreviated MALS. What is MALS? In extreme brief, it is a syndrome characterized by chronic postprandial abdominal pain and weight loss due to compression of the celiac artery and or celiac ganglia. It's also known as celiac artery compression syndrome, which may be a little misleading as we'll get to in a few minutes. Let's discuss the clinical presentation in a little more detail. The most common symptom present in almost all patients is chronic abdominal pain. The pain is usually postprandial, meaning worse shortly after eating, but it can also be triggered by exercise or be constant. Roughly half of patients experience weight loss, which can be substantial, and a significant minority of patients experience nausea and vomiting, but this is only rarely the most prominent symptom of the condition. The physical exam is most often normal, but there can be epigastric tenderness and an epigastric bruit present from turbulent blood flow moving through a partially compressed artery. Overall, MALS is believed to be a rare diagnosis, though its specific prevalence is unknown. There is an observed female to male predominance of about 4 to 1, it most commonly presents between the ages of 30 to 60. To understand the hypothesized pathogenesis, it's necessary to review some anatomy. Here's a view of a normal celiac artery showing where it branches off from the aorta. This view is looking from the front of the patient, anterior to posterior, and slightly upwards from underneath the diaphragm. The celiac artery is extremely short, branching almost immediately into the common hepatic artery left gastric artery, and splenic artery. The median arcuate ligament is a fibrous band of tissue that is attached to the diaphragm and which wraps around the aorta, normally superior to the celiac artery. In addition, there are two paired structures, not specifically pictured here, called the celiac ganglia, which are nerve bundles in the area adjacent to the celiac artery. The ganglia are responsible for sending signals from the autonomic nervous system to the GI system and for sending signals, specifically pain, from the gut back to the brain. In MALS, there is an altered relationship between the median arcuate ligament and the celiac artery, such that either the artery takes off from the aorta too superiorly, or the median arcuate ligament is too inferior, and thus the ligament compresses the artery. The prevailing theory as to how this leads to the symptoms is relatively obvious, a lack of blood flow leading to ischemia. After all, the celiac artery supplies blood to much of the gut, the liver, gallbladder, spleen, and pancreas. However, this may not be the mechanism in all patients. It's also been hypothesized that compression of the nerves in the celiac ganglia and plexus are responsible in some, if not most, patients. Evidence for this includes the fact that collateral circulation develops over time in response to ischemia, but the development of collaterals does not seem to lessen the symptoms of MALS. Also, many patients with radiographic evidence of celiac artery compression have no symptoms whatsoever, and the existence of many asymptomatic individuals with objective compression has even led some surgeons to express doubt that the syndrome even exists, though this is a minority viewpoint at the present time. As you might expect, diagnosis relies heavily on vascular imaging of the celiac artery. For this, there are four options. Duplex ultrasonography, CT angiography, MR angiography, or catheter-based arteriography. Each of these have advantages and disadvantages. For example, both CT and MR allow for the simultaneous investigation of other potential explanations for the patient's symptoms. However, an important aspect of diagnosis is that the degree of compression in MALS varies throughout the respiratory cycle, specifically with more compression at end expiration. It is not practical to compare compression during inspiration and expiration with CT or MR, while this is relatively easy to do using ultrasound. Here's a CT angiogram showing the compression of the celiac artery as it leaves the aorta. It's even more evident on a 3D reconstruction. Notably, despite having a seemingly objective way to identify the presence of MALS, owing to its rarity, it is still considered somewhat a diagnosis of exclusion. So before a patient can be diagnosed with it, they typically need not only positive evidence of the diagnosis, 
but reasonable evidence that more common explanations for postprandial pain are not present. This may include imaging of the gallbladder and pancreas, upper endoscopy, and maybe even a gastric emptying study. More recently, the transient relief of symptoms following a celiac plexus nerve block has occasionally been used to identify patients who may have MALS despite a lack of arterial compression, highlighting the hypothesis that MALS symptoms are driven primarily by nerve compression or other nerve dysfunction rather than ischemia. When it comes to the differential diagnosis of MALS, that is, the set of other diseases which can present similarly, it most obviously includes other forms of mesenteric ischemia. For example, plain old atherosclerosis can affect the celiac artery or other mesenteric arteries resulting in postprandial pain with or without an abdominal bruit and with an otherwise unremarkable exam. This specific mechanism is what is typically implied by the term chronic mesenteric ischemia, despite the term sounding less specific than that. A vasculitis affecting the mesenteric vessels is a less common alternative to atherosclerosis, but potentially worthy of consideration in some younger patients and in the those who lack atherosclerotic risk factors such as hypertension, smoking, or diabetes. Chronic pancreatitis can lead to chronic postprandial abdominal pain and nausea, though most patients will have had at least one episode or more of easier-to-diagnose acute pancreatitis beforehand. Gastroparesis can cause postprandial pain and nausea, but the nausea and vomiting tend to be a more prominent symptom rather than the pain. And the functional GI disorders of irritable bowel syndrome and functional dyspepsia are also considerations given that they, along with the other diagnoses here, often have an unremarkable physical exam. The distinction between functional disorders and MALS can usually be made on history, with IBS having prominent bowel symptoms, while patients with functional dyspepsia typically describe their symptoms as postprandial bloating or fullness rather than pain, but there is some overlap in the symptomatic experience that patients with all of these conditions can have. So how is MALS treated? It is fundamentally an anatomic disease, so treatment is surgical. The specific procedure performed in most patients is called a median arcuate ligament release. At the present time, a laparoscopic approach is generally favored over open. Due to concern that involvement of the celiac plexus contributes to symptoms, a celiac ganglionectomy is often performed at the same time. If celiac blood flow remains poor after release, which can be assessed during the initial surgery, other additional steps that can be considered are celiac angioplasty, reimplantation of the celiac artery into the aorta, or aortoceliac bypass. If the initial procedure was laparoscopic, these might require conversion to an open one. Also, it's currently unknown if performing these additional revascularization procedures results in better outcomes than just the initial release and ganglionectomy. Finally, there is prognosis. In appropriately selected patients, and that's a huge caveat, surgical intervention usually results in immediate improvement or even resolution of symptoms. But it is important to ensure that patients going to surgery have a high probability of having MALS to begin with, which can be tricky given the far from perfect correlation between the radiographic findings used for diagnosis and symptomatic disease. That's it for this brief introduction to the median arcuate ligament syndrome. If you found it interesting or helpful, please consider subscribing to Strong Medicine and checking out more videos like this on a variety of other medical conditions.